Essence Armstrong Vaughan, and I am the coordinator of the Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program, which is responsible for this webinar this morning and the rapid response grant action component element that we're going to be discussing. You will have an opportunity to have your questions reviewed at the very end. So we ask that you put your questions in the chat and we will discuss them at the end of the presentation. And I indicated earlier, just for us to know who's on the call, please provide your name and organization and contact information so we can follow up with you. I'm very happy that so many of you can join given the times that we are operating in. So I really appreciate it. All right, so this morning's session, we're going to run through, I'll give you an overview of the Biopharma program. Some of you are familiar with it and some of you are not. So those who are, bear with me as I go through information that you already know. Then I'll give you a brief introduction to the action component of the program. And then we will dive into the rapid response grant and provide you with some details on, on this call. And then we will have the question and answer session at the end. So the Biopharma program, Biopharma stands for Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program. It is an initiative of the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, and it's financed by the European Union's 11th European Development Fund. Biopharma is implemented globally via partnership of the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and they are focusing on the protected areas and biodiversity components. And the Joint Research Center, which is responsible for facilitating the scientific element of the program. Biopharma is a six-year program, so we're running into our fourth year of implementation, running from 2017 to 2023. We had a phase prior to this, so we're building on that in this aspect. Biopharma is implemented across 79 developing countries and small island developing states. These countries have more than a combination of 3 billion people whose livelihoods depend on the natural resources and holds more than half of the world's 35 biodiversity hotspots. And we're working in more than 9,000 protected areas, both terrestrially and marine. So it's a big program covering the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries. The mission is to reinforce the management and governance of protected and conserved areas in these 79 countries through better use and the monitoring of information and capacity development on management and governance. These elements or this mission is being implemented through three main pillars, regional observatories, which are key to the implementation of the work on Biopharma. And they're basically resource hubs that are located in each of the regions and with a responsibility for supporting the management, collation, use and analysis of data and information related to protected areas and biodiversity. The reference information system is the platform on which these regional observatories function. It's an online system, an open source system, and is responsible for us being able to manipulate and disseminate the information that is available on our protected areas. And finally, the action component, which is a grant mechanism of Biopharma and which is responsible for the webinar that we're having this morning. For the Caribbean region, the implementation of Biopharma is with the regional office of IUCN which is for Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, and it's based in Costa Rica. We again are partnering with the European Commission's Joint Research Center, and our regional implementing partner is the University of the West Indies. We are operating in 15 countries, and we have a map here of those 15. These are the 15 member countries of the Organization of Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific States. Our focus within the Caribbean is in three areas looking at information for decision making, and that is being managed through the regional observatory, which is called the Caribbean Protected Areas Gateway, and the URL is right here. You can have a look at it. It's under development, but we are working to work with you to have the information that is relevant for the needs of the Caribbean. 
And the idea again is to focus on data and information management analysis and provide access to assessment tools and reports. The other element that we are working through to implement biopharma in the region is through capacity building for effective management uh, with a focus on promoting the use and application of management effectiveness, uh, facilitating regional and national workshops along this vein and providing support to countries to actually implement assessments where possible. And finally, supporting the implementation of the action component. As I said, this is a grant facility, and this element is meant to implement and support and aim at strengthening protected areas and natural resource management effectiveness and governance. So just to give you an overview of the action component now, the overall objective is to improve biodiversity conservation in priority areas, priority areas being legislated protected areas, key biodiversity areas, areas within your country that have been identified as areas for protection and management of biodiversity. And we're doing this through funding tangible on-ground actions that address management and governance priority actions identified by diagnostic tools. Diagnostic tools being management effectiveness assessments, validation or research studies, validated research studies, and so on. Specifically, the action component is meant to enhance the management and governance of our protected areas, strengthen the legal framework required to achieve effective biodiversity conservation, and knowing that our local communities are dependent on these areas and the services that they provide. We are also aiming to support local community initiatives so that the livelihoods of local people can be enhanced while contributing to effective protected areas. The allocated budget for the action component overall, this is across the entire ACP region, is 21 million euros. We have priority areas that are eligible in 78 of the ACP countries, and that's across six regions. The Caribbean is one region, the Pacific is another, and then Africa is split into four regions, Central, West, East, and South. The types of grants that have been available so far, we had a medium grants call last year, which ranged from 100,000 euros to a maximum of 400,000 euros. The potential implementation time period is 36 months, and the scope is a national to regional level uh, implementation. We had another call, the small technical grants call later in the year, and the range for that is between 50,000 and 100,000 euros. And the implementation period is a maximum of 12 to 24 months, and the scope of implementation is at the local or national level. And we now have the rapid response grant call open for a maximum of 50,000 euros, implementation period for a maximum of 12 months, and the impact for this is really at the local level. So now we're going to get into some details on the rapid response grant. So what is the purpose of this grant? It's to respond to the risks and difficulties induced by the COVID-19 crisis. And I know we have seen a big impact here in the region. And so the idea is to be able to provide some support to alleviate the challenges that have been felt. So, for example, the allocation of budget at national level and the reduction of budgets for PAs would have been one of the key areas that would have resulted in difficulties or challenges being faced. Economic consequences for staff, health and security of staff, reduction of incomes from ecotourism, economic consequences for local community livelihoods, health and security of local communities, environmental crimes, et cetera. These are some examples of some of the risks and challenges that would have been faced or are being faced by our protected areas. So the objective of the grant, the rapid response grant, is to enhance management and governance of protected and conserved areas. So again, trying to meet the overall goal of the objective of the action component. We also want to increase resilience to major shocks and recovery of the protected and conserved areas, including sustainable, innovative funding planning. And we want to try and maintain livelihoods and or enhance resilience of local communities to major shocks caused by the COVID pandemic. 
but again, whilst effectively contributing to protected areas management. So applications that come into this call should respond to emergency situations requiring rapid action, not existing long-standing programmatic issues. So examples of emergencies and the emergencies that come in will be assessed against the following criteria, the urgency of it. How recently has the threat emerged or worsened due to COVID-19? We will only support emergency situations that have arisen in the last few months or weeks. In the case of the Caribbean, February, March would have been the time frame that we would have started to see uh, any type of impact from this situation. So that's the time frame that we are looking at following the global onset and spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, or if the intensity of an existing threat has suddenly worsened. These are the types of things that will be considered. Time sensitivity is another area. Will there be a measurable conservation benefit if activities start quickly rather than in several months or years? And projects that require immediate assistance will be prioritized. The duration and reversibility of impact. Does the threat have the potential to cause long-lasting negative impact to the biodiversity value of the priority area or the community livelihood? These are some of the things that you need to consider um, when you are developing your actions, because these are what we will be looking at in the assessments and they will be prioritized. So who is eligible to apply for this grant? Public or private legal entities, registered or incorporated company or an organization that is registered as a separate legal entity in an eligible ACP country. So you have to be registered in one of the 15 Caribbean countries that I identified earlier. Examples of eligible organizations are national and subnational agencies, authorities and organizations, NGOs, community-based organizations, small socio-professional organizations, small and medium enterprises, small profit organizations. International NGOs and regional organizations are also eligible to apply, but they have to meet these criteria of being registered in an ACP country. And also protected and conserved areas represented by its legal representative. The organization or entity must already be involved in the management, governance, and the community livelihoods of the protected or targeted priority areas. You must be involved in that. You do not have to be the main entity. You must be directly responsible for the preparation and management of the grant, and you must not be a beneficiary of an, an, any other grant funded by the European Union for the same activities. So for example, persons or organizations that received grants under the medium grant call or the small technical grant call will not be eligible to apply for the rapid response grant. And there are other European uh, funded projects that will make you ineligible if you have access to European funding. So again, just to reiterate, where these are the 15 countries, Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Dominica, Dominican Republic, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago. Guyana and Haiti are highlighted in red because OECD organizations are eligible to apply in these two countries in the case of contracts. So any OECD organization that wants to apply for a rapid response grant is only eligible to apply in one of these two countries, Guyana or Haiti. If you are an NGO or a CBO or a national organization registered in all any one of these 15 countries, you are eligible to apply for the grant. So what types of activities can be covered or funded under the rapid response grant? As I said earlier, they must address emergencies, and we've talked about what those could be and how they will be evaluated, resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions put in place in it. It must be consistent with the Biopharma Rapid Response Grant objectives. The activities must achieve tangible results and impacts within one year, because the duration is 12 months. And these will be tracked by clear indicators in the project logical framework. 
activities must comply with IUCN's environmental and social management system. It must enable data and information sharing from the project with the regional observatory and the reference information system, and it must be cost efficient and sustainable. So here are some examples of eligible activities, maintaining or increasing patrolling and or anti-poaching operations, training for anti-poaching control, wildlife trafficking and monitoring, equipment purchases, so if you need a vehicle or a boat to conduct surveillance, you need communication devices, boundaries and zoning demarcation tools, personal protective equipment for field staff, these are eligible, participatory patrolling, and monitoring, so engaging your communities in patrolling and monitoring, developing and promoting sustainable livelihoods, alternate economic activities for local communities in and around protected areas are also eligible. So examples, small-scale aquaculture, small-scale community-based sustainable agriculture are some eligible activities. Involvement of young professionals and or other vulnerable groups and members such as women and indigenous people. Enhancing protected and conserved areas resilience, so improving the recovery actions, increasing sustainable or innovative funding. Enhancing communication and promoting virtual wildlife tourism experiences for sustained local income are some options. Enhancing community resilience to major shocks such as pandemics and sharp decline in tourism. So again, building resiliency within your community, livelihood opportunities and coping strategies that support gender equality and empower women uh, options. And avoiding total or partial change of the protection status of existing protected and conserved areas into other status for economic reasons. Again, this is, these are some examples. This is not an exhaustive list. Whatever is applicable to your situation would be eligible, but justification of course would be required. Some actions that are not eligible. So you cannot purchase land. The purchase of land or involuntary resettlement of people will not be allowed or funded. Activities on indigenous people's lands or territories without having obtained their free prior and informed consent will not be eligible. Activities on land contested by local communities or indigenous people. Activities that negatively affect physical, cultural resources and their access and use including those important to local communities, the removal or altering of any physical cultural property, including sites having archaeological, paleontological, historical, religious, or unique natural values, activities significantly affecting vulnerable groups within local communities, indigenous peoples, or where these communities have not provided their broad support to the project activities, and activities that include the procurement, handling, storage, and use of unlawful pesticides. These are ineligible, will not be funded by this grant. So the environmental and social management system screening is a, an important element of the application process. Projects will not only be assessed for their technical value, also be appraised for the potential to address negative environmental and social impacts or whether they foster best practices. And we are using the IUCN's ESMS system to do this. And th this system is based on eight overarching principles and four standards. So these are the four standards, the eight overarching principles. In this rapid response grant application, we have a simplified version of the process. We have some basic questions to help us ascertain what potential ESMS impact maybe from your project, but you must complete this in order for the application to be eligible. If your project is shortlisted for further evaluation, then you will be required to complete the full questionnaire for the ESMS screening. The rapid response grant application process is a simple process. It's not like the medium grant, which was very complicated, and it's not like the small technical grant, which was less complicated than the medium grants. This one is a one-step process, submission of a full proposal. So there no, there's no concept and then full proposal. We're going straight to the full proposal. The call is open-ended, meaning from now until December 31st at 23.59 Central European time, you can submit an application for the rapid response grant. 
I have put here the local times when the call will close, which will be 6.59 p.m. if you're in Atlantic Standard Time, 5.59 p.m. if you're Eastern Standard Time, 4.59 p.m. if you're Central Standard Time. If your application submission is after this date, then you will be ineligible for the grant. Once you have submitted your application, the intention is that six weeks from that time, you should be able to receive a response on the final decision for your application. Applications must be submitted in either English or French. Spanish, unfortunately, is not one of our official languages on the program. However, information will be provided on the guidelines in Spanish very soon. The application must be submitted online on the Biopharma Action Component Portal, and the URL is here, and you have to have an account to actually enter and apply. We will not be accepting handwritten proposals, and all incomplete proposals will be rejected. Okay, so to give you an idea of how to apply, as I said, it's an online process. So this is what you would see when you go into your online account and apply for the rapid response grant. The general information page is the first page and it has 18 or 19 questions on it that require you to, that you need to complete. Basic information on the title of the project, name of the lead applicant, the type of organization of the lead applicant. If you have a co-applicant or partner organization applying for funding, then you provide their information. The priority area, the name of that area where you're going to be targeting your actions. If it is registered in the World Database on Protected Areas or any other global database, that information will be come here. If you are not the supervisory authority, but there is one, then you include that here. It's usually your government agencies and so on. So this is the first page of the online application that needs to be completed. Throughout the online process, you have a button like this on every page where you can save your progress. So you do not have to com complete your application in one sitting. You can save your progress and come back and you will not have lost information that you would have entered before but you must save progress on every single page. The second page is the simplified logical framework. This must be completed. Again, basic information on who you are, your organization, et cetera. And in here is where we need you to populate information on your project. What are the results of the activities that you are going to be implementing? Because we need to be able to measure impact and change. So when you are completing this section, you will add the result. You will click on this button and it will give you a series of pages to complete and input information. Once you have completed those steps, then you will end up with something that looks like, you should end up with something that looks like this. What is your result? What is the indicator that is going to help us measure that? What is the baseline for that? indicator, the year, the number, what is the target, what do you want to achieve at the end of the 12 months, how would you verify that you did achieve this indicator. You can come up with your own indicators or, or and you can use the Biopharma action component indicators which are built into the portal. So the ones that are identified here that you see here is one of the biopharma indicators that you can select if it is applicable to your project. The final page is a very important one. This is the page where all the documentation for completing your application needs to be uploaded. There is an application template which is available here and it's also available on the action component portal and it's also available in the guidelines for the grant. You need to complete that document and upload it here. You need to upload any additional information. So if there's a consultation report that will support your project, helping to justify why 
you should receive funding for this project or any other documents, you include them here. We need the CV of the staff that will be involved in the action, and that comes here. The declaration must be completed. So again, you download the templates and you reload it once you've completed it. If you have a co-applicant, they need to complete the mandate. Due diligence needs to be completed as well. This helps us to determine the level of um, ability of your organization to manage the funding. So this is a very important uh, element that needs to be addressed. We also require you to upload the budget, which is unfortunately not in this image, but the budget template can be downloaded similar to, you'll see a button like this under the budget section. You need to download that template and complete it and upload it along with any other supporting documents that are needed. This page needs to be fully completed in order to have your proposal be considered eligible. Just to give you a sense of how, how your application will be assessed, these are the evaluation criteria that will be used by the assessors. Emergency is 10 points, so it's actually the largest uh, criterion and the most important one. So you need to be very clear on what your emergency is and why it is relevant and why it should re receive funding through this grant. Technical coherence and relevance of the activities. This is, is also an important element. Your activities need to respond to the emergency and to facilitate changes in impact over the one year period. Technical capacity, financial coherence and justification, sustainability of the activities and understanding the risk and response to the ESMS are the other areas where you will be um, assessed. The quality of your proposal will be assessed. Only proposals that attain a total score above 21, 21 and above, will be submitted to the validating committee for a final award decision. So in order to be able to get to this point, please ensure that all of the areas, all of the questions in the application form are filled out clearly. You have provided sufficient information for the assessors to be able to make a fair judgment. Please remember that while you are familiar with your site and your situation, the persons assessing these evaluations, while they have an understanding of the Caribbean context and they may have worked in some other protected areas, they do not know every single protected area. They do not know every situation. So please present your information in a way that allows the assessor to get a full understanding of your situation so that they can judge you and hopefully reward you fairly for accessing this grant. Okay, this is the final element that I wanted to look at, the elements of the budget. So the budget must be cost-effective and clear. Your actions must be relevant to the overall purpose of the project and the costing of these must be effective and be very clear. There's a section on the budget for justifying the expenses that must be completed because it helps the financial assessors to fully understand how you came up with the costings that you presented. This grant does not require you to have co-financing. In terms of the budget costs, you have two options that can be used for representing your costs, a reimbursement of real costs or a simplified cost option. At this stage of the process, if you already know which one you want to use, you can identify that in the budget template when you submit it. However, if your grant is, if your proposal is accepted, the financial team will go through this with you and ensure that the most appropriate option is applied to the cost of any given action. Indirect costs can be allocated up to 7%, a maximum of 7% of the indirect costs can be charged. And the financial support to third parties or what we would call subgranting is not allowed. These costs listed here are the eligible costs and on the budget template, 
these categories are identified. So you can uh, identify costs under one or all of these cost categories, human resources, travel, purchase of equipment, vehicles and supplies, local office costs, and other costs and services. Other costs and services will refer to external services that you have to, um, that you may need to acquire. These costs are not eligible, debts and debt service charges, provision for losses or potential future liabilities, costs declared by beneficiaries and financed by another action or work program, land and building purchases, as I mentioned before, currency exchange losses, credit to third parties, government salaries unless they relate to new activities and costs leading to personal or private profit. So just to give you a sense of the real cost option versus the simplified cost option, estimated costs for real cost option is what you would enter in the budget. And then reimbursement is based on actual costs. So the budget that you will submit in the application stage will be an estimated cost budget. If your application is approved and you're going through to the granting stage, reimbursements, any activities that fall under the real cost option will be reimbursed when you implement the project based on the actual cost for that activity. This option, however, has a very high administrative burden during the reporting, implementation and reporting of the project because you have to account for every euro that is spent and you have to have the supporting documents to go with it. So every receipt for every expenditure needs to be made available for reporting. With the simplified cost option, unit rates are agreed upfront. If you have an expenditure, say um, fuel, that is going to be a regular cost, and it's a, I should say a regular expenditure, it can be determined at the revision stage before the grant contract is signed, that a fixed rate will be applied to the cost of fuel. Once that is agreed, then costs are paid based on achieving the output. This reduces the likelihood of reporting errors and it has a lower administrative burden. But as I said, these two options will be finalized if your proposal is approved for receiving a grant. The activities that are listed will that will be put into one of these two categories um, following discussions and negotiations with the financial team. And just to give you a sense of what the budget looks like, so when you download the budget, this is what you will receive. And the categories, as I said, for the eligible costs are here, one, two, three, and then the other two further down. You have to input, the project proposal number, this is the one that is generated on the portal. You indicate your units, your unit measure, and then you would be able to input the details, number of units and the unit values and so on. This column has predetermined formulae in them. So try and not make any changes to this column because the information you enter here will automatically be calculated here. This column, the justifications column is, as I said, very important. The information you input here should explain why or how you generated the cost that you presented here. This helps the financial assessors to understand better your um, reasoning for identifying that cost. There is an example of a budget on this tab. So when you download the budget template and you click on budget example, you will see examples of how to input information into each of these categories, along with examples of how to justify the cost. So just to wrap up the process, we have the pre-announcement and the call. So the call is open now. So you can submit your rapid response grant proposals to the portal, once they have been submitted, the regional team will evaluate submissions. If any information is needed, they will get back to you to clarify information. Once the assessment team has completed their review, a report is done and sent to the validation committee, which is the European Commission and the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States. So basically the donors are our validating committee and they will review the submission 
and determine whether it is valid for an award or not. Their decision comes back to the Action Component Secretariat and the proposal, I should say the final decision is made known to the applicant. This entire process from the time you submit to the time we come back to you with a decision, ideally will be six weeks. I say ideally because things do happen but we want to make this as rapid as possible. So that is why we are going to be pushing as much as possible to have a quick turnaround time so that you can, if you're successful, you can receive your award and you can implement your program over the next 12 months. So where you can find information and you'll probably have already checked it out, the Action Component Portal, action.biopharma.org is where you will find more information on the Rapid Response Grants you'll find the rapid response grant guidelines. And as I said, they are currently there in English and French and the Spanish will be there soon. There's the ESMS manual, which will give you some information on the environmental and social management system of the IUCN and how that process works. There's also information on the procurement policies for IUCN. And for this, I should say for the Biopama grant. And if you have any questions or queries, this is the email address that you should use to ask your questions and you'll get a response, hopefully in a relatively quick time. So that's everything I wanted to cover with you today. So hopefully you have some questions that I can respond to. If I am unable to respond to your questions, I would revert to the grant management team and come back to you with those answers. So I will turn over to Justin, my colleague, to help me with this process. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'll be now going through the questions that appeared in the chat. So the first question was, do activities need to occur within a protected area? Right, so as I said, um, our the aim of our grant is to support protected and conserved areas. Ideally, we want those to be, and they have to be priority areas. So most of our priority areas are legislated protected areas. They can also be key biodiversity areas. But I just want to find the correct terminology in the grant guidelines. So I tell you exactly what we are referring to when we say a priority area, because we do define that. Our priority areas, we define those in the wider conservation landscapes to include, among others, key landscapes for conservation where identified in the country, key biodiversity areas, marine managed areas, or other protected and conserved areas mm -hmm. where their importance is justified by a diagnostic tool or strategic document in the ACP country. So in short, it does not have to be a protected area, but it has to be an area where you can show with justification that it is a priority area for conservation in your country. Okay, we had a comment. In Guyana, online proposals are difficult for indigenous communities and they need help the most or they need the most help. So in the event where you cannot complete an online proposal, now it's possible that an, another agency can partner with the indigenous community and be the lead agency to complete the application. Where there would be a challenge, if it cannot be done online, then you need to let us know and we can determine how we can facilitate the application. The reason we have gone to the online system is to help us to collate information and um, make the links with the regional observatories, which are online platforms. The more we can have the information already input at the start online, it makes us it makes that process easier for transitioning information to the regional observatories where the final information and indicators and so on will be made available. Okay, um, there was also a question a comment and a question about i think it related to the evaluation criteria uh, where the individual asked um, about um, communities having to go to an organization 
and they asked if what if those organizations already have an independent EU grant but are doing this for a community? Okay, um, as I said before, if you are the lead applicant and you have an EU grant already, then you will be ineligible for this, to apply for this grant. So in the event that you are the organization uh, applying then, and you already have a grant, it makes you ineligible. If the community has the capacity to apply for themselves, then they can do so as a community-based organization, for example. If they're registered, then they can, can apply. I don't know if I'm answering the question. Is that clear for you? Hi, it's Raquel from Iwakrama. Um, the Hi, problem Raquel. is that um, some of our communities are having impacts and they don't have the online access. So that's why I was asking, we already have a grant. So if we can help them, or maybe if we can help them, uh, but we already have a grant, so it's very difficult. It puts us in a difficult position. Um, so that's that's right why I was asking. Like, the grant is not from, from us, but it may have to come through us if some consideration could be given for that. It's not our grant, it's for the community. And we have, we have a few communities now that have are starting to have direct impacts. Right, that so is it. something we would have to ask of the head grant team in IUC. Thank you. Um, thank you. So that is a situation I can present to them and see what. Yeah, what, thank um, you. Also, I missed the email address. I missed the email address. If you guys can put it up when you're when it's finished, I really would okay. be happy. For you. Thank you. Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Right. We also had another question. What is the difference between reimbursement costs and simplified cost options? But I believe this probably was answered in the presentation about the simplified cost option. Well, yes, it was answered, Justin. I was uh, looking for that to ask that same question, but then I realized how it seems answered it later on in the presentation. Okay, okay perfect. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, the next question was, what are the indirect costs? Okay, so your indirect costs are basically those that um, are not fully covered by the project. So, for example, if you do not put in um, significant costs for uh, local office operations, the indirect costs will cover that. So your utilities, your rent, printing, uh, copying supplies, that type of thing would what is what would be covered in indirect costs. Okay, someone asks, what is the status of the Small Technical Grant Awards? The Small Technical Grant Awards were, um, a final decision was made and the notifications were sent out, I am trying to remember, last week maybe. So if you did not receive, if you applied and did not receive a notification, please um, send a response to the email address that I showed earlier. So I will have to go back on that and um, someone will respond to you. Okay. So this person joined late. What are examples of activities that qualify as emergencies? So there is a slide that speaks to some of those and the guidelines as well, but you're basically looking at um, if you're in a protected area and you want to beef up your surveillance because that was impacted, so patrolling and surveillance, training for improved surveillance and um, monitoring, uh, community-based monitoring and um, patrolling, um, involvement of youth, uh, young professionals and indigenous peoples and women. Um, yeah, anything that will improve your situation. And again, as I said, uh, livelihoods, uh, improving the livelihoods of your community. So if you're looking at alternatives um, to um, physical tourism or whatever the case may be, those are eligible activities. But again, it's dependent on your situation and what you see as needing um, as being viable solutions 
And that's why I said in your application, please present what your, clearly what your situation is and clear justification for why this is a need. And don't take it for granted that the assessors will need to understand. I have been, Hello. Was my, I, Dominic, that was my question. And um, okay. I, I, I wanted to find out though whether a situation where you have budget restrictions or limitations due to, to COVID-19, whether you can apply for a grant to to mix those shortfalls. Right, so towards the beginning of the presentation, I think I'd identified that budget cuts, for example, would result in some of the risks that you would be facing. You will have to indicate that those budget cuts are, 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 are a result of the COVID-19 situation and what your um, government's actions were and how they are impacting on your work now. So one of the things we won't fund is, and I think it was identified there, is the salaries of staff, unless it's for new activities. If you've had ongoing activities that are not necessarily impacted by COVID, then we can't fund those. But if those ongoing activities were threatened or increased, or the threat of them increased, or anything along those lines, then you need to justify that, and it would potentially be viable for funding. But you have to present the information and the justifications why this is needed. I also wanted to make a point that I think somehow I find this process designed almost to limit the limit in our like, successful applicants. I just wanted to, to put that in there. You know, it's it's limiting it's having gone through it one time, you know, it it, it seems a little bit easier, but I'm worried about those people who would really want to apply, uh, you know? Right, so as I said earlier, I mean, this application process is the easiest of the three that we have had so far. Um, and I say the easiest in the sense that it's really just an application form that needs to be completed and the information has to be put in. Um, there's no, the budget, again, I think it's fairly simple because don't forget this is only for one year of implementation. So it's not meant to be complex in any way uh, in terms of the actions that need to be implemented. I understand that there may be some limitations in capacity of persons. And as much as we can support as a team in facilitating the online process, I mean, we cannot do the application for you, but we can guide you through what would, as I said, like giving you guidelines, you know, present justifications and that type of thing. Um, I think that's what well, that's the best that we can do from this end because we cannot get into the full, unfortunately, development of proposals. But I think this process is the most simplified of the processes that we've had so far. Yeah, I'm agreeing, but uh, I just wanted to put that in there because I need mean, to making some of the comments about, you know. Yes, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Yes, and that's fair. And again, these are the types of things that we need to trans that will be translated to the decision makers, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that presented us with the guidelines and so on. So as much feedback as we can give them from the stakeholders that, stakeholders that they want to help the most, um, that's that's what we will try to do. And hopefully, that not for this one, but probably for other calls that would come out, we can see some of those improvements in those. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And rest assured, I'll try again. I'm okay. giving up. Please don't. There's, the funding is there to help us. So as much as we can access this money in the region and use it, let's let's please do. Okay, we had another question. Can a grant be submitted that supports sustainable financing of the PA system of a country? Of a country, I am I don't think so. So again, this has to respond to an emergency or a need um, for a local site. If, if you're going countrywide, I'm again, we'll have to get some justification, but the idea is to be impacting on the ground at a specific location. Okay, next question. Can an agency apply for a rapid 
response grant and small technical grant at the same time? If not, can the small technical grant be applied for immediately after the rapid response grant? Okay, so as it is now, the small technical grant was closed and decisions made. So the only call that is open and eligible for applications is the rapid response grant. If there are any calls that come out between now and December, the criteria for how um, criteria would be defined uh, regarding whether you can apply or not if you've received, for example, a rapid response grant in this case or a small time. But at this stage, the only call open is the rapid response grant. So if you have not received a small technical grant or a medium grant, you can apply for this one. Okay. What are your reporting requirements and how will Biopama share project information and activity successes to share best practices quickly to help everyone? Okay, so once a grant has been an awarded and a grant contract signed, um, the grantees will have technical and financial reporting requirements um, that would look at responding to the logical framework. The logical framework should be defining um, the actions and the results of the program and how those have are being um, implemented and impacted. The results of those will be shared primarily through the regional observatories and the action component pages of the Biopama program, uh, the Biopama websites, um, and the grantees, the awarded grantees websites. Communications will be developed, um, whether it is uh, informational leaflets and that type of thing, those will be <clears throat> developed during the course of implementation uh, of the grants and they will be shared via the various medium media that we have. Okay. How long from submission of proposals to award in best of cases? For this, um, Rapid response round, as I said earlier, we're hoping from the time you submit to a decision will be six weeks. And that's in the best of cases. Yes. Okay. We're pushing for six weeks. <laughs> Great. Okay. Under the maintained livelihoods and or enhanced resilience of local communities objective, would an organization be eligible for funding if the funding would be used as recovery for staff so that the protected area continues to be maintained and managed? The majority of the staff in this example are members of the local community. So the staff of the protected area have been laid off. Would that be the scenario? Hi, good morning. Hi, Asif and morning. everyone. Yes, in this scenario, we are assuming that the staff has been laid off. My guess is that yes, the funding can be used, but let me please follow up with uh, the regional, the grant coordinators, because I know that they did say within the guidelines that uh, salaries would not be covered for governments. I do not know if it would apply, how it would apply in this scenario. So please let me confirm how that works and get back to you. That's Thank you for that. All right. So we will follow up with um, the grant managers and let you know. Okay, thank you. Okay. Someone um, is would like clarification. Uh, could you clarify the ineligibility based on receipt of the EDF funds, please? You mentioned grants, but does this also apply to budget support programs that a country or sector may receive from the EDF? I do not know, so I will have to ask that question as well. I assume any funding from the European Union, whether it's grant or otherwise, will be the case, but let me confirm that, please, because I'm, I'm not sure. Someone also asks, can all the policy documents requested be in the entities by laws? Can I get that clarified? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. Would the bylaws cover the, the policy documents? This was by Michael. Yeah, hi. Yeah, no, I think I think there, there are some bylaws. Our bylaw is very extensive. I mean, there's different kinds of... Uh, of bylaws, we have in, in our bylaws a number of the things requested in the for the policy documents. For example, um, uh, it talks about uh, um, uh, in terms of um, 
the if you, if you look at the you, in the in the application, it specifies things like um, uh, um, certain um, uh, um, policies with regards to um, uh, ethics and, and and ethics and so forth. So the, all all these things are mentioned in our in our in our, by, in our bylaws. But it's not it's not in a separate document, ethical um, um, standards and, and and behaviors and so on. It's not in a separate document. This is related to the due diligence uh, as element. Right. So all of those things, if I'm our accounts, we have special um, 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 procedures in our bylaws about the accounts, about um, uh, where a book shall be kept. So all of these things, it is, it is the application asking them separately, but they are in our bylaws. Okay, okay. Um, you can upload the bylaws, and if your um, proposal is approved, the finance team may require to maybe re may require you to submit the actual document so they can see the full, you know, what the full um, policy is. Yes, yes, yes. My 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 intention was to submit the bylaws uh, automatically with the application. Right, but there should be room to upload additional documents. Yes, yes. I, I'm saying yeah. I, it was my intention to do that. I just wanted to clarify that that right. is okay. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, definitely. All right. Um, thanks. Okay, another question. If we are beneficiaries of another Biopharma grant, not as a lead applicant, are we still eligible for a grant? If you are a co-applicant, if that's what you mean by beneficiary, then no, you will not be eligible. If you have received a Biopharma grant as a co-applicant, you will not be eligible to apply for the rapid response grant. The eligibility criteria for the lead applicant also apply, applies to the co-applicant in this instance. And the next question was very similar where they asked if uh, you have received a Biopharma SDG, can you still apply for the rapid response grant? So that would be no. no. Hi, hi, Sins. Good morning. Good morning. This is Vasantha from St. Lucia. Good morning. When you were talking about both the cost options, I got the impression that they were based on reimbursements. Uh, am I correct in understanding that reimbursements means that you will have to make the payment first and then on submission of the financials, um, the funds are reimbursed by Biopharma? So how it will work? Um... When yes, it will be a reimbursed mechanism, but you will on the first round receive funding. So what if your proposal is approved for an award and you have the grant contract, an initial disbursement will be made, uh, a particular allocation will be made to the organization to facilitate the implementation of activities. And then as you move along in implementation, the Costs that are identified as real costs will be reimbursed as the actual cost. If you have costs that have been defined as um, under the simplified cost option category, then whatever that um, predetermined figure was, rate was, is what would be used to, um, to again, reimburse the cost. So yes, it would be on a reimbursement basis, but again, based on, you would receive an initial disbursement, and then based on um, subsequent financial reporting, uh, the disbursements would be made accordingly to facilitate okay. the implementation. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Are there, if there are no other questions, thank you very much for taking the time to, to join us this morning. I hope the session was useful. And as I said, if you have any further questions, you can send them to biopharma.ac.info.caribbean at iucn.org. So thank you very much again for taking the time and I wish you all the best in these uncertain times and please submit your applications. The funding is there to be used for your needs. So we look forward to receiving your applications for the rapid response grants. Thank you very much and have a good day.